Hi, this is Kathy Kennett, uh, Senior Vice President with uh, with PPMD, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today. We're very happy to be joined by Thomas Meyer, Chief Executive Officer and Chief Scientific Officer of Santhera Pharmaceuticals, as well as Jody Wolf, Director of Patient Advocacy with Santhera Pharmaceuticals. Before I turn it over to them, I just want to remind everybody that you're on mute. Um, so if you have questions, please type them in the chat box in the left corner of your screen, and we will address those along with the one the questions that were submitted online at the end of the webinar. So uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, Jody and Thomas, and I'll turn it over to Jody. Hi, this is Jody Wolf. I'm the director of patient advocacy here in the U.S. for Sancera. I've been working with boys with Yushen and their families for over 20 years. And my role on the Sandera team is to ensure that we are incorporating the experiences and the needs of families with Duchenne into everything that we do. We'd like to start today by thanking PPMD for hosting the webinar. Their partnership has truly been vital to our work. And most importantly, we would like to thank all of the families who have been a part of our phase two and three trials. And to all of you who are joining us today who are interested in learning more about the Citeros trial, our second phase three trial of adepinone and uh, boys, in boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. With that, I will turn it over to Santhera, CEO and Chief Scientific Officer, who has been a scientist in the field for over two decades, Dr. Thomas Meyer. Thank you very much, Jody. Thank you very much, uh, PPMD and organizers. It's my pleasure to be with you this evening. I'm calling from Switzerland, and I would like to give you an update on the following topics, which I'm uh, advancing now in the slides. First of, all, first of all, a very brief introduction to Santera and Idebinon, the molecule that we study for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And then I will summarize very briefly the results from the already completed phase three trial that we call the DELOS trial, which enrolled patients 10 to 18 years of age not using concomitant steroid treatment. And I will summarize the positive outcome on the respiratory function that, have we, that we have observed in this trial. But most importantly, I will focus on the introduction to all of you to the now ongoing phase three trial, which we call the CITAROS trial, which is in patients actually on concomitant steroid treatment. And I will talk about the study design, the key inclusion and exclusion criteria, the duration of the trial, and then also the location that we are running the trial in the United States. Now, in the next slide, very briefly, our commitment to the DMD uh, community. The company, Santera Pharmaceuticals, is founded, was founded in 2004. I'm actually one of the founders of the company. We are based in Switzerland, as I said before. But most importantly, recently, a couple of weeks ago, we have uh, expanded our uh, presence, and we have now actually opened up a U.S. operations and office in the greater Boston area, of which uh, Jody Wolf is a part of it, although she is not located in Boston. She is located in Arizona. Um, as those of you who know us, we have a strong and long-term commitment to find treatments for mitochondrial and neuromuscular disorders, including Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, the drug that we are studying also for DMD, which we call Raxone as a trade name, the molecule's name is Idebinon, is already approved in the European Union for the treatment of a disease which is an inherited form of blindness called Leber's Hereditary Optic Neuropathy, or LHON for short. We have in the past completed two clinical trials with Idebinon. One was a phase two trial uh, of one year's duration, and that was followed by a confirmatory phase three trial, the DELOS trial that I mentioned before, which was positive in its outcome and enrolled patients not using concomitant steroids. Uh, this was actually one of the first trials ever that included non-ambulant patients in the trial up to 18 years of age. And I will already mention that the new trial that we are, that we are running now, the CEDROS trial, will enroll patients of unlimited age, uh, upper limit, because uh, we, we do not see a need for limitation on age. And I will illustrate that further in a later slide. I should also say that Raxone is currently under review by the European Regulatory Agency, the European Medicines Agency, and its uh, reviewing body, the Commission for Human Medicine and Products, CHMP, for the use in boys not taking steroids. 
and we are about to uh, plan to re-engage the FDA also in discussions on an early approval pathway for this patient group, that is patients not using steroids. But as I said, the new trial that we are introduced to you tonight is the CEDAROS trial for patients on stable dose of steroids. Now, before we go into this, I would like to summarize briefly the medical need for an effective treatment of respiratory illness in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In this chart, here you see the staging of uh, the disease and medical complications that involve the respiratory function include ineffective cough, nocturnal hypoventilation, sleep disordered breathing, that is restless sleep, and daytime respiratory failure. So with age, uh, patients are exposed to reduced respiratory function, which leads to medical complications needed for assisted ventilation. And as you all know, the complications of the cardiac and respiratory uh, nature, or the resp cardiac and respiratory complications will become life-threatening at older age patients. Now, how do we actually assess respiratory or pulmonary function in Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Well, that is done in a typical spirometry test as illustrated in this chart. To the left, you see a, uh, a uh, hypothetical curve. To the center and to the right, you see actual real examples. You see a comparison of a DMD patient in panel B with an age-matched individual, healthy individual in panel C. And what these curves illustrate is actually the flow volume curve. This is the exhalation, so the exflow of air, and then the inspiration uh, loop of the respiratory function. And what we measure as um, parameters of respiratory function is this maximum speed with which a subject can exhale, which is called the peak expiratory flow. That's the top of the curve here or here, and what is called forced vital capacity. This is the lung volume that is shown actually on the x-axis, so this would be this point in the DMD patients, and it would be this point here in the healthy individual. And what you can clearly see that both parameters, peak expiratory flow and forced vital capacity, the lung volume, is reduced in the DMD patient example shown here on that slide. And that's the medical problem. That causes the medical complications. Now, you might say, uh, well, we are all using, or most of the patients in, in the U.S. and also in Europe are using steroids. And it is well established that glucocorticoid steroids have a beneficial effect to patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. However, the effect of steroids is limited with respect to pulmonary function. And this is illustrated in this slide. What you see here is in uh, blue, these are patients using steroids, and in green are patients who have never used steroids or have stopped using steroids. And what you see here is the a pulmonary function test, one of the two I just introduced to you, and this is forced by the capacity, the lung volume parameter, and you see that is normalized to percent of predicted. So 100% would be totally normal for the age that is in question, and age is shown here on the bottom of the, on the x-axis of the chart. And, and obviously, the smaller the number gets, the worse is the pulmonary function or the lung volume in this respect. And what you see is that the 80% threshold, this is commonly accepted as the, the start of a pathological uh, decline in respiratory function is reached at about 10 years of age in patients who are not using steroids and about 12 years of age in patients using steroids. However, from that point onwards, when the threshold of 80% is reached, there's a uh, almost um, identical rate of decline in both of these groups over the age range between 10 to about 20 years of age. So, Although steroids can delay the start of pulmonary function decline, once this decline has been started, it, uh, the steroids are no longer effective and there's no effect on the rate of decline over time. So clearly we need other measures or other means to uh, protect lung function in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. 
Now, the importance of preservation of lung function has been uh, assessed in a collaboration that uh, PPMD did together with us, mainly PPMD did the work, I should say, uh, and this was a patient-centered benefit-risk study. What the study showed, which is in the meantime published, uh, is in a, a community-engaged approach, PPMD was asking the priorities for treatment for disease aspects not directly related to muscle function. So we are not, we were not interested in, in for instance, uh, walking ab ability of the patients, but rather uh, asked questions around other disease domains, including respiratory functions. 155 participants uh, joined that survey, and uh, it is the, the evident or the result that we have obtained clearly demonstrate that the treatment of pulmonary disease, in particular the preservation of an effective cough and the prevention of airway infections, was very highly prioritized by patients and caregivers alike. So clearly it is, uh, very, it is seen valuable by patients and caregivers to preserve pulmonary function, in particular in patients who lost the ambulation status, so he, who are already in the wheelchair. Now be, before we go into the description of the clinical trials that we have already conducted and those that we're currently doing, I would like to spend two slides on the mode of action of how the drug actually works. And for this, we have to review very briefly in a high-level summary chart here uh, what happens to a, a muscle cell that lacks dystrophin. And as you all know, lack of dystrophin is the cause of the disease. And what happens when, once a muscle cell um, lacks dystrophin, uh, during cycles of contraction and relaxation, the muscle cell is no longer protected from um, damage of the cell surface. And these holes that appear during cycles of relaxation and contraction uh, lead to an uncontrolled influx of calcium. Now, muscle tissue per se can manage calcium influx very well, but at a certain point, actually, the damage is too large, and as a downstream consequence, mitochondrial function is impaired. Now, mitochondria are organelles or little particles in the cell that are responsible for energy production. And when mitochondria do not function properly, there's lack of energy, which the muscle cell obviously needs for the contraction work, and there's also an increased level of cell damaging reactive oxygen species, ROS, here in this chart, which cause inflammation and further downstream pathology of the muscle. So this is very well established. Uh, a downstream consequence of dystrophin deficiency is impairment in energy production and also uh, elevated uh, um, levels of cell-damaging reactive oxygen species. Now, what does idebenone do? It's illustrated in this slide. Idebenone actually increases the... Um, output of ATP, so it actually um, acts against this loss of ATP, which is the cellular energy um, currency, if you wish. So this is the molecule that actually provides energy in the cell. And normally in this cascade of starting from loss of dystrophin and aberrant calcium influx, which leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, in these cells ATP is reduced, but idebenone can increase it again. And also in these cells, uh, in these conditions, reactive oxygen species are elevated, which are um, scavenged and, and destroyed by idebenone. So it has a dual mode of action, preservation of cellular energy production and protection from cell damaging reactive oxygen species. Now, with this, I would like to turn over to our clinical development program that we have completed over the years, and that is shown in this first chart, number 10. Um, you see, we started our clinical development work already in 2005 with a phase two program that we call the Delphi and Delphi Extension Program. I will not touch on that result uh, tonight. Uh, these are published. It was a pilot study that involved patients who were taking both, with both groups of patients, those who took steroids, which is uh, indicated here in 
in GC glucocorticoid users, so steroid users, and also steroid non-users. And the outcome of this Delphi trial program helped us to design a phase three program that is called the DELOS trial. And one of the results that the Delphi trial uh, taught us was that we need to separate steroid users from non-users in order to investigate the efficacy of our drug because there might be differences in the rate of or in the time of this respiratory function decline in both of these groups. So we decided that the first trial that we run was in patients not using glucocorticoid steroids. And that started in 2009 and ended in 2014. And I will summarize very briefly the outcome of this trial before we actually come then to the new trial, which is the CEDROS trial that, is a, that has started now, and we, we uh, increased enrollment in this trial. So back to the, to the DELOS trial. What have you learned from the DELOS trial? <clears throat> so the DELOS trial, first of all, the patients uh, that were enrolled, they were 10 to 18 years of age, and there was no selection for a mutational status. So any mutational background uh, was eligible for enrollment. But the patient had to be off chronic steroids. So they could not use the flasacord or prednisone at least one year. They had to stop at least one year prior to enrollment into this DELOS trial. 92% uh, of the patients that we enrolled were actually non-ambulatory. So the vast majority were already in the wheelchair at the time of study start. And all of these uh, patients had to have already an established respiratory function decline, which was determined as below 80% of peak expiratory flow uh, percent predicted. So they were already in the decline phase of respiratory function. Uh, we randomized uh, 64 uh, patients, 31 of whom were on active treatment. Uh, this is uh, 900 milligram a day and 33 were on placebo. I should say that our drug is an oral medication, so patients <clears throat> have to take uh, in this trial that we are talking about now and also in the trial that is about that has started, they are taking two tablets with each meal, so two tablets with breakfast, two tablets at lunchtime, and two tablets uh, with the dinner meal, which result in the dose of 900 milligram per day. The average age of the patients enrolled in that trial was 14.3 years, and the treatment duration was 12 months. Now, the overall outcome of that trial, the DELOS trial, have already been published. Uh, the main outcome of the trial was published in the Lancet, a very prestigious medical journal, in 2015. And last year, we added a number of uh, additional publications uh, looking at certain aspects of the trial outcome. And for instance, uh, one that is very important for us here is the publication by Craig McDonald from California who analyzed the data from the trial with respect to res uh, respiratory complications. And I will summarize some of these data in one of the slides I'm going to show. So I'm really referring to some of the data. I will not go into extensive details, but the question that you might ask is, so what was the benefit from Raxona adenine treatment in the patients enrolled in the DELOS trial? Now, if we start from the primary endpoint, <clears throat> which was the change in peak expiratory flow, one of these parameters I introduced you in the beginning, over time. And what you see here is the change from zero from baseline to week 52 for the active treatment group, which is in orange. So this is the treatment group that received the active drug. And in gray, that's a group that received placebo. And reduction as seen here is a worsening in respiratory function. So we see that the placebo group, they lost 8.8 percent points on that scale. Uh, this was highly significant, uh, whilst the active treated group lost a much smaller fraction, and so there was a relative 70 percent uh, difference between those two. And at week 52, the difference between the active treated group and the placebo group on average was 6.3 percentage points, and that was statistically significant. So the trial met its primary endpoint, and this is in fact the first phase three trial 
ever that reported out a positive outcome with a primary endpoint met in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now we looked at a number of other respiratory function outcomes. Just uh, I illustrate only one. That is the one that the second one that I introduced during the beginning. This is the change in lung volume or forced vital capacity. Again, we have the decline in the placebo group over the 52-week study period and a slower decline in the group that received active treatment. And here the relative difference was 37%. Here at week 52, the difference was not quite statistically significant. The p-value was 0.08, which is not quite uh, statistically significant. But at the other study weeks, for instance, week 39, was a clearly statistically significant difference. So we can conclude from that that we were able, with these parameters, to slow down the loss of respiratory function in these patients. Now, you might say, rightfully so, what, what is actually, what does the patient feel? Is it uh, something that the patient take notice of? And the answer is probably not uh, the change in forced vital capacity. That's similar to you're not able to really distinguish your blood pressure. But there are other outcomes that clearly demonstrate the benefit for the patients, which I would like to summarize in, in one slide here. So these were uh, the proportion of patients with bronchial pulmonary disease. These are actually uh, diseases which include airway infections. And we saw a much higher number of patients, uh, 17 in the placebo group compared to 6 in the Raxon group, that reported such bronchial pulmonary disease events. So 28 events were reported in the placebo group and only 7 in the active treatment group. That if you count the number of days <coughs> that patients reported these uh, bronchial pulmonary disease events, were 222 days in the placebo group compared to 82 days in the Raxon group. So clearly, fewer patients reported fewer events of bronchial pulmonary disease, including uh, aspects like uh, airway infections. In fact, actually, there were fewer patients hospitalized due to such bronchial pulmonary complications. We had four patients hospitalized in the placebo group compared to only one in the Raxon group. And these four patients together were in hospital for 30 days, and the one patient for Raxon was in hospital only for three days. So overall, the number of days in hospital was quite much slower, uh, smaller in the placebo group compared to the active treatment group. And likewise, we also saw that there was less need for antibiotic use to treat bronchial pulmonary disease in these patients. Again, we had 13 patients or 39% of patients in the placebo group reporting 17 events where they needed uh, antibiotics to treat their uh, bronchial pulmonary infections compared to <clears throat> only 7 uh, subjects, equivalent to 22.6%, reporting 8 events. Again, overall, there were patients on placebo needed 105 days of antibiotic uh, treatment compared to 65 days in the uh, treatment group for Raxone. And this is important. If you remember, I showed in an earlier slide, the um, PPMD survey, patient and caregiver survey, that clearly pointed out that uh, bronchial pulmonary uh, infections are of concern to families and to, and to patients with DMD. And so we were able to demonstrate that this is reduced uh, in, in patients treated with the active uh, agent Raxone. So let me just go to the next slide. So a question might come for safety. What is the safety profile of the drug? Well, <clears throat> we have studied idebinone uh, in safety and efficacy studies uh, since uh, 2005 in several indications in phase one to phase four. We have dosed uh, patients, including children, up to 2,250 milligrams per day, which is 2.5-fold above the dose that we are using in the now ongoing CIDROS trial. The cumulative exposure in Santeras trials were 657 subjects were actually exposed uh, or enrolled in trials, of which 487 were exposed to idebinone. But idebinone, as you might know, is not a, a molecule that um, – that we invented recently, that's a molecule that was invented many years ago already by a Japanese uh, company, and we redeveloped it for higher uh, dose. Um, and the safety database that had been compiled over the years that this molecule 
is already investigated, comprises over 4 million patient years of post-marketing uh, treatment from what is called PSURs, these are periodic safety update reports. So we have, including the safety database from Takeda, more than 4 million patient years of safety data. In general, we can say adebanon is very safe and generally well tolerated. The most commonly reported adverse reactions to adebanon are mild to moderate diarrhea, which usually does not require discontinuation of the treatment. We see some nasopharyngitis, a cough, and back pain has been reported. But all of these were mild and transient. I again repeat that the drug is approved at the dose that we are now testing in the Cideros trial uh, for another indication in Europe uh, for the indication Levis hereditary optic neuropathy. Again, underlying the safety profile, this was acceptable to regulators in Europe. Now, coming back to our overview chart where we summarize the ongoing and planned clinical trials for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, I'd like now to turn our attention to the new trial, the CDROS trial. Now, in contrast to the DELOS trial, this time we, we study uh, only patients who, who are on concomitant steroid use. So this is a clearly different uh, patient population. To summarize the overall uh, objective and the, and the design, so the objective is to assess the efficacy of idebenone, Raxone, compared to placebo, in delaying the loss of respiratory function in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which are receiving glucocorticoid steroids. So in, in the slide, you can see that the DMD patients that are eligible for enrollment must be on stable steroid treatment. They could be either deflasacord or prednisone, but they must be stable for six months before they enroll in the trial. Uh, another important criterion is that they have to already uh, they have to present with established respiratory function decline. That means that the lung volume, forced vital capacity, uh, expressed as uh, percent of predicted, must be below 80 percent, but should be above 30 percent at baseline. So there's a screening period between the screening and baseline up to six weeks, and we plan to enroll uh, in excess of 266 patients into this trial. Participants will be randomized one-to-one, -one, so half of the patients will receive placebo, and the other half will receive active treatment. Again, this is adebinone tablets, so subjects are... Um, are asked to take two tablets with, uh, with the morning meal, two tablets at lunchtime, and two tablets with dinner. Uh, so in total, again, a daily dose of 900 milligram. And every subject, so the trial actually takes 1.5 years, so it's 78 weeks is the study duration. And once the study is over, participants are uh, invited to enroll in an open-label extension study where um, everybody is receiving active medication. So this is the overall design. In the next slide here, I would like to summarize what are the assessments that we are planning to do. First of all, there will be spirometer assessments. These are shown in the top part of the slide. These are uh, test systems that allow you to measure your lung function. Uh, these will be conducted by trained and certified respiratory therapists at the study centers. We measure peak expiratory flow and lung volume parameters, including also forced vital capacity. We also will use, again, uh, a small little handheld device shown on the bottom, which is now called NMD1. We had already used the, the precursor of this little instrument in the uh, Phase 3 DELOS trial, which is uh, to be used at home. So patients actually can use that device at home once a week to record their lung function in the home setting. So not in the hospital, but at home. And this device records the lung function tests and they will be then transferred to the computer at the doctor's office uh, during the next visit. And this device uh, measures again peak flow, so a flow parameter and another volume parameter here measures forced expiratory volume in one second. That is a, a measure that is very similar to forced vital capacity, and so we collect as much data with this device as possible, and um, families or the patients are invited to use that once a week uh, for a more frequent data collection. 
And we have very good experience with this device from our previous phase three trial. Now, what are the inclusion criteria and the, and the endpoints? <clears throat> so inclusion criteria obviously is a confirmed diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As I said before, patients had to have a certain loss of respiratory capacity, so they should be below 80% of forced vital capacity percent predicted, but, mu but must be above 30%. They should be on um, chronic steroid use, uh, before enrollment, and uh, they should be able to have a reliable forced vital capacity between screening and baseline uh, of 15%. We will stratify the, the patients <clears throat> according to their baseline forced vital capacity, uh, either between the 30 and 50% group or 50 to 80%. And uh, we allow uh, both regimes, daily or intermittent steroid use regimes, and we will stratify according to those as well. Now, the primary endpoint is a change in forced vital capacity. This is the lung volume parameter. Secondary endpoints uh, are in, in, in peak expiratory flow, and we also measure the time uh, patients lose 10% of their forced vital capacity. Uh, we also look at other endpoints, uh, which is the change in peak cough flow. Uh, then also looking at um, blood oxygen saturation and entitled breathing and bronchopulmonary illnesses, the one that we have uh, observed also in the, um, in the DELOS trial, and antibiotic use. It is very important to mention that uh, patients are not um, excluded based on any mutation status, so we can uh, allow patients into the trial with any mutation status, and ambulatory status is also not a, a, an inclusion criterion. And as you can see on that chart, we have no upper age limit. So we have already a patient in the trial is, uh, with uh, 22 years of age, so we, we can accommodate uh, patients of well over 18 years as long as they fall into the criteria for lung function tests shown up here. And that's, I think, very important. Um, next slide. So what will be required from participants, uh, obviously, study medication intake. Uh, this will be either active treatment in two tablets three times a day or the matching placebo. Uh, visit to the clinic every three months for 18 months. <clears throat> so this is uh, something that needs to be considered. We, as I said, we encourage uh, study participants to record respiratory function at home. Uh, in between visits using the handheld device. Uh, then you need to record in a patient diary intake of study medication and any side effects. But um, all patients who complete the last visit, which is after 78 weeks, and are considered eligible by the investigator will be able to participate in an open-label extension study, which we call the CIDROS extension study. And this is uh, to be continued until marketing authorization for adebinone uh, in DMD is obtained. Now, we are running this trial in, in more than 60 sites in the United States and Europe. Uh, we have 24 sites uh, in sorry, 26 sites in the United States, and they're all listed here uh, on, on the right-hand side. The red color indicates uh, that these sites are already actively recruiting, and the black color uh, indicates that sites are to be um, still in, in, uh, in initiation, and they will be able to recruit soon. We will obviously update um, this list as we go on, and you will be able to retrieve the information on active sites uh, over time. Now, what are the tools that we provide you to stay informed? Um, we are uh, almost ready to start up a um, trial website, so www.cideros.com will be available soon, where we update uh, the public on, on our progress and, and any uh, information that is needed for participants. We also have a trial brochure that is be handed out to study centers <clears throat> that you can retrieve and, and uh, get informed. We also have, um, and we invite you also to consider clinicaltrials.gov, <clears throat> which is a uh, a government site allowing you to retrieve information of any clinical trial and also the one that we are talking about here, the CIDROS trial, under the number given here, uh, uh, this number here. And you find it also if you type in CIDROS in the, in the search engine of this site. 
Um, next, um, just as a summary, what I wanted to share with you uh, now in my presentation is it is clinically very important to maintain respiratory function in patients with DMD, in particular in patients who have become non-ambulant. Now, we as a company are very committed over the past uh, 12, 15 years in developing new treatment options for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, specifically targeting respiratory, the respiratory component of the disease. Uh, we have studied adebanon in a phase two study and already completed a successful phase three uh, uh, study, both of which were placebo-controlled 12-month trials. As I mentioned, the phase three DELOS trial demonstrated an ability to slow the, slow the loss of respiratory function, uh, also resulted in a fewer respiratory illnesses, which include uh, respiratory-related um, hospitalizations. So patients on active drug had fewer of those events. And the CITROS trial is ongoing and recruiting, and the trial is focused on boys in respiratory function decline receiving glucocorticoids. And we can enroll non-ambulant patients, and we have no upper age limit, uh, just the respiratory function are the important criteria for enrollment. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation. If you want additional information, please uh, send an email uh, to cideros at santera.com. This will be uh, read by Jody Wolf, uh, or contact her directly, and she will be able to help you with your, with your questions. And with this, I would like to end my presentation, and now we're turning to the Q&A session. Fabulous. Thank you so much, John, Thomas. That was really, really wonderful. So I have lots of questions about um, older guys and if they're eligible for this trial. And it sounds like absolutely there's not an upper age limit and uh, the requirements are based on pulmonary, pulmonary function, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So there's no upper age limit. As I said, we have already a patient in the trial is 22 years old, uh, but he, the, he fulfills the criteria of having already a loss of respiratory function, but he has some residual function left. And this is the only criteria we look at. So there's no upper age limit per protocol. Excellent. And sometimes when um, there's, there's some loss of cardiac function, then there's not an exclusion criteria related to cardiac function either? Well, uh, overt heart failure uh, is um, is an exclusion criteria, but this needs to be checked by uh, by the study investigator. Okay, thanks. Um, so one of the questions that we have is uh, based is about the label. So have, I'm sure that you have thought about this, but based on the Citros trial, have are you expecting that this will facilitate a broader label uh, to both steroid users and non-steroid users? Yeah, so let me just summarize where we stand um, here from the regulatory point of view. I mean, the data that we have from the DELOS trial, as I said, is in patients uh, not using steroids, and this is exactly the label that we're currently discussing with European regulators. Um, the completion of the CITROS trial, should it be successful, would allow us to uh, in also include patients on steroid treatment in a label. So um, eventually that actually is the goal that uh, of, upon completion of the CIDROS trial, if it is successful, that we actually can enroll or can encompass all patients irrespective of their um, mutation status and irrespective of their steroid use status. Okay, thanks. I'm sure you know that many, many families use um, supplements that they get off, uh, over the counter and get online, and many people are, have taken known that they've purchased online. Can you talk a little bit about the potential benefits of uh, Raxone and the differences between Raxone and the uh, Idevinone that's currently available? Yeah. So let me just talk about general about supplements. Um, we we are aware that many families of, or patients are are using uh, supplements, uh, including CoQ10. Uh, that is not a problem. Actually, it is um, allowed in the trial as long as it does not exceed a certain threshold. Uh, but you do, you do not you do not need to discontinue uh, your standard supplement cocktail if you have taken that stably for for a period of time. Uh, now, idebinon is a prescription medication, um, and, and here we are in a different, uh, let's say, situation. The FDA has uh, 
rightfully so, uh, ruled already back in 2002 that idebenone is a synthetic molecule and must be approved for use in humans before, uh, after safety and efficacy studies. I'm fully aware that there are currently uh, versions of that molecule sold illegally uh, also in the United States to, to families and they buy it. Um, I cannot say what the difference is because I actually don't know what is in these in these uh, tablets or capsules which are currently sold by these vendors. Um, I also say that um, we observe that some of these vendors actually take advantage of our work that we do in running clinical trials and, and actually using our data to advertise their products, which is uh, unfair, I would say. Uh, also, we need to be aware that um, in forms that you buy over the internet, um, there's no pharmacovigilance systems provided. So if anything happens, um, God forbid, with, 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 the, with the patient using such formulations, there will be no system to report the adverse event or seek for medical help. Now, that all is governed by the FDA's regulation to qualify Debenon as a prescription medication, and that's why we actually we develop it uh, according to the FDA guidelines and with the, with the uh, um, support of the FDA. And I should say that the protocol that we are currently running, the Citrus trial, has been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. So, um, as I said, I mean, I, I do know that families are buying such versions over the Internet, but it is not the, uh, the way the FDA would see that molecules need to be developed, and we are doing it the proper way. Okay, thanks. If people are taking that medication now or a Debenone over-the-counter over the, that they're buying online, is there a washout period? Um, to, uh, before they would enroll in your trial? No, that's uh, a very, uh, no, this is, um, we have not foreseen that. So it actually, it has to say that they should not have taken Idebenon. I mean, technically, as I, as I said, I mean, uh, it's, it's not approved in, the, in, in this country, uh, also in Europe. Um, so we, we, we cannot allow patients in the trial of, in the past use Idebenon. Okay, thanks. So if they've used that gentleman in the past, then they won't be allowed in the trial? No, that's that's per protocol, yes. Okay, thank you. That's, that's very clear. Um, okay, so there are many patients that are now um, eligible to take us on skipping drugs, uh, Exondas. Sorry, sorry, I, have to, I'm, I, just, I was just reminded. I, <laughs> I did a mistake, obviously. Okay. <laughs> Roxana sitting next to me. She's the more experienced person here. So um, apparently we are allowing patients in with a wash-up period. So this has been changed. It was from a previous version. Uh, and, and so we, we are allowing patients in with a wash-up period of Idebenon, but I don't know exactly now what the wash-up period is. Okay, okay, thanks. This will be, okay, this will be available to the treating physician. I apologize. It was a mix-up on my side. Oh, no, that's fine. Thank you for clarifying. That's really helpful. So patients that are amenable to XM51 skip if they're taking Exondus, uh, will this be an exclusion criteria for the trial? Yes. I mean, if they're currently taking it... Uh, sorry, um, that's a, a, a question that I think Jody wanted to ask, answer. Sorry, Jody, over okay. to you. Uh, yeah, no worries. Um, participants in other trials or on inve other investigational drugs cannot be a part of the Adebanone trial, but this also includes Exondus 51. Okay. Thanks. Um, and you showed us the clinical sites. That was a question as well, so thanks for that. Um, do you have any idea when you anticipate or hope for FDA submission and approval? Uh, well, I, at this point, I cannot comment on that. We, as I said, we are in, in discussions with the FDA whether there's a possibility for an early approval in patients not taking steroids that the patient population we studied in the Delos trial, but I cannot, uh, we are not yet uh, um, there that we can definitely say that. Uh, if we have to wait for the CEDAROS trial, we, we anticipate that the trial with your help of patients and communities help is fully enrolled by the end of this year and then it takes 18 months so we would have the the study end would be in the second half of 2019 and then we would be able to um, apply for registration in the United States. Okay, thanks. Thomas, do you know if this, this, if this medication will be available at the pharmacies or will you use a specialty pharmacy or have you thought that far ahead? 
Oh no, I have to say I'm I'm the wrong person to <laughs> to answer such <laughs> questions. I, uh, I I don't know how we how this will be done. It could be specialty pharmacies, but I'm not very familiar with the situation in the United States, and this should be answered at a later point in time with my colleagues from the U.S. Okay, good. So I think we've had questions about it, you know, once the trial is complete, will you still be able to get access to the drug? And you've said yes, that there is an extension, open-label extension, after the year and a half of the placebo control. Uh, there's another question about the Citeros trial and the major data milestones in the timeline, and I think you mentioned those as well. Um, peak expiratory flow percent predicted, force vital capacity percent predicted, and then respiratory infections and antibiotic use. Is there anything else that, that you plan to collect in this? Yeah, we also look at uh, yeah we also look at time to medically relevant thresholds of lung function. So we look at the time until patients who are above 50% uh, reach that level uh, and other thresholds as well. We also capture if that might happen the time to assisted ventilation. So these are all very hard endpoints um, and and these are very relevant for the. Um, clinical care of patients and therefore also relevant for, for regulators. So these event counts uh, will be recorded as well. Okay, that sounds great. Are you looking at any other body systems other than respiratory in this trial at all? Any time function testing or um, any uh, upper lung, limb function, anything else? No, and actually uh, that's a good question, but it, we decided that we rather accommodate also patients which are more severely affected than those already in the wheelchair and older patients, and therefore we cannot really investigate um, limb function and, and muscle strength in limbs. So we focus predominantly on respiratory function parameters, uh, test maneuvers, uh, time to event analysis, and also blood gas analysis, and really focus on that aspect of the disease. If you if you would um, want to investigate the effect of the drug on muscle strength and ambulation, then we would have to run a completely different trial design. And we decided that we take advantage of our experience in, in non-ambulant patients in the Delos trial that we focus on this population uh, of the DMD community, which we think is still uh, the, one, the group that is not very uh, often considered for clinical trials. Okay, great. Would you expect that a debanone will be a substitute for steroids, or would you anticipate, and I, and I guess it might, just it might be determined by this trial, right? Well, I don't think that is, it's not our intention to, um, let's say, substitute for, for steroids, but <clears throat> as you know, <clears throat> excuse me, Although uh, in, in recent years uh, the duration of steroid use uh, in, was extended and also all the patients are taking steroids, there's still a time point when many patients can no longer tolerate steroids. In the United States, the McDonald Group and the Synergy Group have published data that say that about 40% of patients 10 years and older are not using steroids, and we are focusing now on these patient groups. We do not intend to advocate that should be a premature discontinuation of steroids as long as uh, the patient feels the benefit and the physician is convinced that the patient has a benefit and the uh, side effects are manageable, then we encourage that steroids should be used because they do have a beneficial effect. But at some point, uh, there might be a decision taken by the family, by the patient, and by the physician that uh, the side effects are too heavy and then um, patients have to stop. And at that point, I think one should consider our drug because this might be the stage where there's still some residual uh, pulmonary function left that could be potentially preserved with our drug, and that's what we would like to investigate in this trial. Okay, thanks. We really appreciate that. Um, so this is a question that doesn't have specifically to do with this trial, but there's a question about why do patients, why, why is the lower age generally five for, these, for patients in clinical trials in Duchenne? Can you talk about that for just a minute? Yeah, Maybe there's something for it. Yeah. Totally, yeah, yeah, I'm happy please. to answer that. Um, in clinical trials, we have to be able to measure changes in the uh, participant and the boy. And I believe only recently do we have validated outcome measures in infants with Duchenne, and that's thanks to some of Dr. Ann Connolly's work out of Washington University. Also, if you measure boys when they're declining in function, it's easier to see your drug's effect and if it stabilizes or slows their progression, as opposed to in the youngest boys who are still really gaining a lot of skills up until the age of 
of five. However, I do believe that there are companies who in our field who have acknowledged that this is an unmet need, and some are trying to plant studies in boys under five years old. And you can talk to PPMD more about which trials might be coming up for the younger boys, the littlest of boys. Um, our drug helps slow the decline in respiratory function, and this typically doesn't reach abnormal levels until about 10 or 11 years old. Thanks. That's really helpful. And as Jody said, if, if people are looking for clinical trials and looking to identify which clinical trials may be most appropriate for them, um, they can feel free to contact any of us at PPMD and also to go to the Duchenne Connect website at duchenneconnect.org and look under the clinical trial finder tool. That should be um, very helpful for you as well. Okay, I don't think that we have any other questions. Does, uh, do you have any closing statements that you'd like to add, Thomas or Jody? Uh, there's, I think, one more question about the dose. I think I could address that as oh, well. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, you're right. So, so how did so, you arrive at those? Yeah, we had we have done extensive phase one trials uh, on healthy volunteers, and then also had experience with other indications. Um, we have um, evidence to show that um, 900 milligram uh, given at three doses, so um, 300 milligram three times a day, uh, leads to appropriate and stable uh, levels, plasma levels of the drug. And so that we decided on that dose. Um, and so we have, as I said, it was a safe and effective dose, uh, which led to the approval in another indication. And we had positive results and also very good safety profile at that dose uh, in the preceding phase three trial. And so we decided that we settle also for this trial for the same dose. And uh, lower doses may not be as, as effective, but we don't have that tested really. But we know that this dose is safe and effective, so we, we wanted to test this dose in this population. Okay, that sounds great and completely answers the question. Okay, so I think that's all of the questions. Any closing statements or summary or anything else that you sure you would like to say? Well, I would like to, first of all, thank you, everybody who listened in tonight and, and is interested in this trial. Um, we obviously are very uh, eager to be quick and roll this trial quick and come to a very quick uh, um, outcome of this trial. So we count on your support of PPMD and also the family's support to enroll this trial quickly. And then maybe hand over to Jody for a last word of, from her. Great. Well, Kathy, we just want to say thank you for hosting the webinar today. Thank you to PPMD and for everyone who attended. And um, you can always contact us at uh, sideros at sansera.com for any additional questions about the study. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We're thrilled to have you here. And it was wonderful information. Uh, thank you to Thomas and Jody and for, to Sandera for everything that you're doing for this community, and we're thrilled to have a trial that can include the non-ambulatory patients, so uh, we couldn't be more excited. Thank you very much. Thank if you. If you have any questions, again, feel free to contact PPMD, and with that, we will conclude this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.